Christmas is my favorite holiday. In fact, I think personally that Thanksgiving is actually a Christmas holiday. It's like, yeah, it has its own little time and limelight, but really it's a Christmas holiday. If you think about it, all of the Christmas movies out there, they start with Thanksgiving and there's a Thanksgiving dinner. So really it's, it's a Christmas holiday. So I'm fully decorated before, Christmas, or before Thanksgiving. Um, my house has the lights up. We don't have room for a tree. My husband and I live in a small apartment, but he's a drummer, so we stack the drums up, and then we decorate that as a Christmas tree. It's actually cute. It's actually cute. Uh, But I want to share with you guys a little bit about this Christmas series called Unwrapping Christmas, and it's a series exploring what we've received through the ultimate gift of Jesus the Messiah. And so it's going to be a five-week series. We're going to go through the gift of courage, the gift for all, the gift of joy, the gift of good news, and lastly, the gift of a Savior. And so today we're going to be talking about the gift of courage. And like I said before, I love Christmas. But let's be real, we can plan and we can strategize for the most perfect Christmas, the most perfect holiday, and sometimes things just don't go to plan, right? Some of us, hey, yeah, the come on. Some of us, we may be trying new recipes and they just don't really land. So actually for my first tip today, don't, don't try something new. Just stick with what you're good at, you know. Stick with the good stuff. Or maybe, you know, you're running a little bit late for your Christmas service, which again, It's on the 17th, so make sure you get here on the 17th for Christmas service. And one of my favorites, actually, is my mom also loves Christmas. And something that she does for all of my siblings, even into our adulthood, is she, like, numbers and categorizes the gifts that she's given us. Um, But it's not like I've... uh, I'm one of three siblings. It's not like a one, two, three type thing or like uh, three different shapes. She's got like seven shapes or numbers running on each of those Christmas gifts to label them um, for the purpose of knowing whose gift is whose. But then we get there Christmas morning and she's like, I have no idea whose gift is whose. So it's okay. We'll get there at some point. We'll, we'll, We'll work on that. But I do think that's one of my favorite Christmas traditions is mom going to the Christmas tree, loving Christmas, and so excited to give us the Christmas gifts that she's bought for us. And then she's like, I need to open these. Like, she's the one opening them because she has no idea whose gift is whose. I love it. But today we're going to be talking about the Christmas story. And if we're being honest, this was not the perfect Christmas either, according to man's standards. This was God's plan and his perfect plan But to man, it was all going wrong, right? And so we're going to talk about Zechariah, we're going to talk about Mary, and we're going to talk about Joseph, and how the plans that they made for their future were met with an interruption. And so today... Today's message is called The Chronicles of Courage, and we're going to be unwrapping the stories of courage in the Christmas story, and what we see through the text that we'll be reading, and if you know me, you know I love scripture, so we're going to be going through a lot of scripture today, but what we're going to see here is that there's this common theme throughout the text that we're reading, and it is fear not, or do not fear, or if I would say, have courage, And so we're going to start with Luke 2, 8 through 10. It's going to be on the screen for you guys. And to give you a little bit of context here, Mary and Joseph, they are in um, Jerusalem, and they're they're part of the census, right? And so they're going to, um, sorry, Bethlehem, and they're part of the census. um, And in this text, we also see shepherds in the same area. And it says, And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, this is the first one, fear not, or have courage. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Again, there's the beginning of what the angel of the Lord says here to the shepherds is fear not. 
And we're going to see this as a common thread throughout the Christmas story for Zachariah, for Mary, and for Joseph. Fear not. And so let's, let's start with Zachariah. And what we can learn from Zachariah is that he has the courage for the waiting. Or God gives him courage for the waiting. And to give you guys a little bit of context here, it's significant that an angel of the Lord is speaking to Zechariah. If you know, um, you know, theology and history when it comes to scripture, God was silent for 400 years before the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah. So this is a significant moment. And also with Zechariah, him and his wife Elizabeth, they were barren. They were, they were in their old age asking God for a child, praying to God, Lord, would you give us a child? But they were barren. They, they had no child. And so this brings us to Luke 1, 11 through 15. And it says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him. Very similar, right, to the shepherds. Fear fell upon the shepherds. Fear is falling upon Zechariah. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And so again, this is a significant moment, right? Not only um, were Zechariah and Elizabeth old in age, asking and praying for a son, and they were barren, but this broke 400 years of silence. And I, had to, I couldn't help but ask, why didn't they have a son, right? When we look at the text, when we look at scripture, it tells us that Zechariah was a priest. It tells us that him and Elizabeth were doing all the right things. They were righteous before God. They were walking blamelessly in all of God's commandments and the statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. And then this time in this culture, when you either needed a healing, whether you were sick and you didn't have healing, or there was no blessing in your life, or an answer to prayer like Zachariah and Elizabeth, where they were barren, the people of this culture would come upon you with criticism, or bring shame to you, or you would feel guilt, and people would begin to say in this time, well, why don't you have a child? What did you do? You must have done something, right? Is there some type of hidden sin in your life? What is wrong with you? Why is God withholding something from you? And I think a lot of us can, can relate to this. And I think sometimes we bring these feelings upon ourselves when we're in a season of waiting. Whether maybe it's like Zachariah and Elizabeth where you are asking God for a child. Or maybe it's something in your calling. You are asking God for direction. What should I be doing with my life? Or maybe you're praying for your family that they would come into a right relationship with the Lord. And with all of these things, there seems to be silence. And we begin to think, oh man, what are people saying about me? Are they criticizing me? Or maybe you bring shame upon yourself. What have I done? What did I do to keep God from blessing me? Or what about the guilt? Why did I do that in my past? Is it because I'm imperfect? Is it because I'm sin sinful? I think a lot of us can relate to these feelings in the waiting of the why. But have courage. The angel of the Lord says, do not fear. For Zechariah and Elizabeth, the angel says, you will have joy and gladness. Many will rejoice at the birth of your son, John. Your son will be great before the Lord. And we know this through scripture, right? John was the forerunner to Jesus, preparing the way for the Messiah. But what I think is the most significant here, and what brings Zechariah courage, what should bring us courage is the portion of prayer. The text says that 
your prayer has been heard. And we know that their prayer has not just been heard, but it's been answered. We have to understand that we serve a God who hears us. And more than that, listens to us. There are texts that say that he inclines his ear towards us when we pray. He's not just hearing noises. He's listening to our words. And a couple weeks ago here in South Sac, um, during worship, Suya, our worship leader, she was praying and she was like, man, I just feel like God is having me pray for breakthrough right now in my life. And I was like, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. That's so good. I think God is having me pray for that as well. I think that that's something that our church is praying for, breakthrough. And then as I came up for prayer, I feel like God placed on my heart to speak to the people in the congregation because I felt so heavy in my spirit that there were some people who were like, that's great for you. Breakthrough is coming, but I've been praying for a breakthrough. I've been praying for a miracle. I've been praying for a healing. I've been praying and it seems like my prayers are not being answered. And I felt that they were discouraged. That in the silence they said, well, God's just simply not here. And then God brought me to Romans 8, 34. And he really specifically brought me here because I feel the people in the room and then and I feel the people in the room now need to know exactly where God is. And it says this, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And so when it comes to prayer, let me tell you, prayer is extremely important. Prayer is extremely powerful. We say here at Project Church that prayer is our power. And so when it comes to prayer, we see through Jesus' life and his ministry here on earth that every time he went out to minister, he would go and be alone with the Father to pray afterwards. He would make intentional moves to be alone with the Father to pray. And what is he doing now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. He is praying for us. And I think some of us need to be reminded that he's doing that. Some of us need to be reminded that God is hearing our prayers, listening to our prayers. And if you read any of the Psalms, you would know this. I'd encourage you, if you need that truth behind God hears your prayers, God listens to your prayers, go into the Psalms. Read those. Read five and you would know this. But Psalm 116 says this. The psalmist says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. Other psalms say that he is mindful of us. Think about that. The God of the universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is mindful of us. He thinks about us. That's amazing. That in and of itself should encourage you to pray, should encourage you in your walk, should encourage you that God has not kept silent from you. God is not far away from you. Maybe in that silence, he's doing a work in you and he's still continuing to bless you. And we're gonna talk about more about the waiting season when we talk about Joseph and God's right timing. But be encouraged. If you're in a season where you feel like your prayers are not being answered, where you feel that God is silent towards you, be reminded he's listening to you. He hears you. In fact, he's interceding for you, and he does answer prayers. And so God's answer to prayer may not be what we thought. It may be delayed. It may be a no. Regardless of the answer, can I tell you that it is always good. His answer is always good, even if it doesn't feel like it. And I want you to know that God has in mind what is best for his children. And so maybe if the answer isn't what you're looking for, God knows that it's the best for you. Maybe if it's a delay, 
that's good. That's perfect because God knows what is best for you. And if it's a no, that is still good. That is still perfect because God knows what is best for you. Have courage. God hears your prayers. Have courage. God answers your prayers. And so, again, this all comes from this text on Zechariah where God reveals to him, hey, you, you're going to have a son. Elizabeth is pregnant. And six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, the same angel, the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, appears to Mary. And in this text, we see that Mary is favored, although she may not feel like it in certain moments. And so this next point is courage for the favored. And we see this coming out of Luke 1, 26 through 38. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying. Now, this is the third time that somebody is greatly troubled when an, an angel appears to them. And honestly, it kind of makes sense. If you read in scripture what angels look like, you would probably be troubled too. So I get it. I get it. She was greatly troubled um, at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be, will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is a sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. Come on. And Mary said, Behold. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. What I see interesting here is Mary's initial response. She said, how will this be since I'm not a virgin? It's interesting because she's not surprised that the Messiah is coming. These people in that 400 years of silence, they understood that the Messiah was coming. But what she's surprised by is, I'm a virgin. This is impossible. How is this even going to happen? Mary, honestly, in this moment, saw herself as the least likely candidate to birth the coming Messiah. One, biologically, she was a virgin. How is this even possible? In second, scripture tells us, and you can actually even see this, Mary has a song that she has. It's called the Magnificat. And in it, she says, I'm a lowly woman. And so she is also a woman of low status. And the reason why she's so surprised here, again, one, she's a virgin. Two, she's a woman of low status. It's so interesting to her, and I think interesting to us, that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would come as a means of a woman of low status. And I think a lot of us can relate to Mary in this, right? Where we see ourselves as the least likely candidate for the calling that God has on our lives, right? I know that, that this is to be true for me. Before I came to Jesus, and I didn't grow up in a church like this. I didn't grow up in the evangelical church. And in growing up, I did not have a relationship with God. I really saw God as this faraway figure that I absolutely respected and, and um, was reverent towards. I had a fear of the Lord, but there was no relationship. And in that, in my teenage years, into my young adult life, I lived a sinful life. 
I lived a life where I had promiscuity in my life, where I abused alcohol and other drugs, and I was simply not a good person. I dealt with anxiety and depression. And so even standing here today, anytime Pastor Caleb or Chrissy asks me, hey, can you preach today, or can you pray today, or can you even do announcements, I'm like, me? I am the least likely person to have this calling that God has given me. Why, how could God choose me? All of that past, even when it comes to my lack of experience, when it comes to ministry and the evangelical church, how could it be me, God? I'm asking the same thing that Mary asked the angel. How will this be? How can this be? And as I was preparing for this message, God told me, no, that's the point. (laughs) That's the point. You aren't qualified for this. You have a sinful life. But just like Mary, God loves to elevate the lowly. God loves to exalt the lowly. We need to be encouraged in that. Even when it came to Jesus, you want, do you want to know what people said about him? They said, what good can come from Nazareth? God loves to exalt the lowly. And this is a word for everybody here because I believe when, we, when I talked about breakthrough earlier, And people were like, well, I don't know if it's going to be me. Because I've prayed for the breakthrough. I've prayed for the miracle. I've prayed for direction in my calling. And it's not there. And it's probably because of the things that I've done in my past. Can I tell you? That's the point. (laughs) God is using you because you are of low status. You understand that you need to come into a place of humility. That's the point. God wants to use that. And I'm so encouraged because we are a church of people that are humbled. We are a church of people that serve God above our calling. We are a church of people that seek after his presence rather than our performance. We are a church of people that would honestly rather be in the hidden place than on this platform. And that's the point. God uses that. And so for anybody in this room that feels like they're stuck in their calling, can I encourage you that God exalts the lowly? So have courage because God exalts the lowly. Have courage because you are not relying on your own power. You are relying on God's power, on his strength. And so even when it comes to this virgin birth, that's the point. She's a virgin because the same Holy Spirit that brought light and life out of nothing, out of darkness, is using a virgin to bring life into the womb of Mary. This had nothing to do with what she could have done. This is all by the power of God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, it says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, a thorn in the flesh, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with my weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So yeah, you're weak. That's the point. (laughs) That's the point. And in this, in Mary's weaknesses, in the areas where she felt disqualified, in the areas where she felt the least likely to usher in the kingdom of God through Jesus, her courage turned into confidence. What we see is she says, let it be to me. And I pray that that would be a phrase that rings throughout this church. That in his weakness, we are 
he is made strong. In our weakness, he is made strong. So let it be to me. Even when I feel disqualified, Lord, if you've called me to it, let it be to me. And so in all of this, Mary is now taking on this calling that God has given her. But what about Joseph, right? I think that Joseph, we don't give him enough love during the Christmas season. But there's something that we can really take from Joseph. And what we can take from Joseph is that there's courage for the faithful. In Matthew 1, 20 through 25, it says this. But as he entered, as he considered these things, which was quietly divorcing Mary because he was like, I don't get it. How are you pregnant? How is this the Holy Spirit? This is kind of like one of those late night TV shows where it's like, you're not the father, Joseph. It's one of those moments. Um, <laughs> it says, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And in this, when it comes to Joseph's faithfulness, as I was reading this text, I was like, God, why didn't you tell him before? Why did you have him wait to hear from you? Wouldn't this have been way easier for Joseph? Wouldn't this have made Joseph a little bit more comfortable when it came to understanding that Mary is now pregnant, that she will conceive of a son? And I began to say, you know, things are not going to plan for Joseph. This is not what he was looking for. But he had faith. What we see in this text with the shepherds, with Zechariah, with Mary, every time that the angel appeared, they had fear. And then they began to ask questions. Mary wondered, how is, how is this to be? But if you see in Joseph's text, in this Matthew text, he wakes up from his dream and he has immediate obedience. And this is so encouraging to me. And I think this is one of the most impactful portions of scripture that I read while preparing for this message was that he was a man of faith. And there is courage for the faithful in this interruption of life that Joseph had where his wife is now is pregnant, has a baby, and he's like, this makes zero sense. He could have in this time um, with this type of action, Mary could have been put to death. Because, but because Joseph was a man of faith, he decided to divorce her quietly. And then the Lord came to him through an angel and said, you know, informed him of what was going on. But his immediate response was obedience. And so courage for Joseph looks like faith to trust God. Take courage. You can trust God. Our Lord is trustworthy. And courage for Joseph looked like immediate obedience. It was pro this was probably one of the most difficult callings that God could give to somebody. <laughs> Joseph was so set apart from it, right? He's not Mary who's con conceiving this child. He's somebody that is coming alongside Mary to support her. And he made the decision not to be with Mary until this child was born. The confidence that he had in Christ, the faith that he had in Christ, in God, 
to walk in obedience, to trust what the angel of the Lord was saying was true, and to support Mary through this, knowing what could have happened to her if people truly knew what was going on. And so have courage. God's timing is perfect. Again, I ask God, why wouldn't you tell Joseph this earlier? But there's reason for that. God's timing is perfect, even if it doesn't make sense to us. Surely it didn't make sense to Joseph. If we're being honest, this still doesn't make sense to us. God, why wouldn't you tell him before? Why would you have his mind going through these roller coasters? But the courage for us is to trust. Trust that God's timing is perfect. He's never early. He's never too late. God's never in a hurry. He's always on time. And this brings us back to the shepherds. Where after 400 years of silence, again, God's timing is perfect. He's never too early. He's never too late. He's never in a hurry, especially after 400 years. That's taking your time, God. He's always on time. And again, it says with the shepherds, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Fear not. Have courage. In fact, have joy. Celebrate. A Savior, the Messiah, is to come. For us, our Savior is here. For us, our Messiah is here. Fear not, have courage, have joy, celebrate. And as believers, I, I honestly think that we shouldn't ignore the things that life brings us. The waiting seasons are difficult and we can't, shouldn't ignore those seasons. We will have feelings where we feel unqualified where we feel that we are the least likely people to usher in what God has placed in us with our calling. We can't ignore the, the reality that sometimes in life, things just don't go right. But have courage. God hears our prayers. God answers our prayers. Have courage. When you feel disqualified, God qualifies you. Have courage. In your weakness, God is made strong. Have courage. God's timing is perfect. Have courage. Salvation is here. It's not something that we have to wait for. You have the opportunity to make a decision today where your salvation is here. Have courage. Joshua 1, 9 says this, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. In all of these things, have courage. God is with you. Have courage. God dwells within you. Have courage, you're not doing it alone. Have courage, do not be dismayed, do not be frightened. And you know, I can't help but think that in a room this size, with this many people in this room, we talked about the courage for the waiting. We talked about the courage for the favored the courage for the faithful. And I'm sure, because I think I, I fit into each of those categories at times, I'm sure that in this room, there are people that need to be encouraged in the waiting. There are people that need to have courage for the waiting. There are people that in this room that are called by God. In fact, all of us are called by God. All of us are favored by God. But I think just like Mary, there are many of us in this room 
that feel disqualified. Have courage. God has qualified you. And I believe that there are also some in this room that are faithful, like Joseph. But things just don't seem to be going to plan. Have courage. And so with every eye closed and every head bowed, if that is one of you, if you need courage in the waiting, if you need courage in your calling, if you need courage in your faithfulness and maybe in a season where things are not going to plan, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah, I see those hands. Hands all around the room. Have courage because God hears your prayers. Have courage because God answers your prayers. Have courage because God has qualified you. Have courage because in your weakness, God is made strong. Have courage because you're not doing it in your strength, you're doing it in God's strength. Have courage because God's timing is perfect. Have courage, he's never early, he's never late. He's always right on time. And I believe that there are some people in this room, again, every eye closed, every head bowed. I believe that there are some people in this room that have not fully accepted the gift of Jesus. There are people in this room where they have not received that gift of salvation. Where in their life, maybe up to now, they haven't felt that courage because they are doing it alone. They are doing life alone. They're not leaning on the strength of Jesus. But like I said before, salvation is here. The Messiah is here. The Savior is here. So if that's you in this room, if you would like to receive the gift of Jesus Christ and the courage that comes with him, nobody's looking, go ahead and raise your hand if that's a gift that you would like to receive. Yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Hands, again, all around the room. We're going to pray this together. And just so you know, the heavens are rejoicing. Every single time a person receives Jesus into their life, the heavens are rejoicing. And this is actually exactly what Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father interceding for. And so we're going to pray this together. You can repeat after me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are our Savior. We thank you that you are our Lord. Jesus, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, that you would forgive me of my past, that you would forgive me of the sins that I make in the future. Lord, I thank you that you forgive my sins, that you went to the cross, and three days later, you, you rose from the dead. I thank you that in you, I have freedom. I thank you that in you, I have life. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. And today I commit to giving my life to you. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.